everybody thank you so much for joining us today to discuss the top five aml compliance gaps and how to close them um i am joined by david winch and ian waters um who will help uh, shed light into what these compliance gaps are and how to close them which is surprising um and welcome to the 10 davids on the call i feel like someone saw that david was here and so then they're like that must be me i'll turn up to this 10 30 a.m meeting um we'll chuck a quick poll up just to get you guys all warmed up this morning um on how confident you are uh, if you were to be aml audited tomorrow um this is just a general sense check in the room of how you guys are feeling about aml um, obviously, if you're here, you've got your little, you've got a hat on, so you feel like you're relatively confident or that you're getting there. Um, a quick welcome to uh, David Winch. Um, if you have not met David yet, um, David and I tend to work a lot together with um, when it comes to firm check and webinars, which is awesome. He's from MLRO Support. Um, good morning, David. How are you Good going? morning. Sophie. Lovely to see you again. I was expecting you to be in Portugal or somewhere like that this morning. And you're actually in it somewhere even sunnier and warmer, aren't you? Well, it's not meant to be. It's been grey the whole time. I'm in Manchester at the moment, but um <laughs> David's alluding to the fact that I'm doing a digital nomad trip. So I'm kind of everywhere in the world for the next three months. So I'm very lucky to work with someone like firm check it lets me do that um and then we've got ian waters here from um compliance from for accountants not from accountants how are you going this morning i'm not too bad um as i said when we're offline a bit croaky this morning so bear with me if my voice gives out but uh otherwise i'm very well not in sunny manchester i'm on the sunny south circular in, of london which has certain alliteration but that's about it <laughs> <laughs> I promise Manchester's been great the entire time I've been here. I'm about to leave in two hours and then it was like, bye, sunshine. Um, so just some housekeeping. So um, we will, and we are recording this session. So if there was anything that you wanted to review back at the end of the session that stuck with you, um, you'll get that recording most likely tomorrow to go over that. You are welcome to share it with your peers. Um, we are a chatty Cathy group um, and we have some really great people here, obviously, who have awesome knowledge when it comes to AML. So um, if there was anything that we're talking about that you want further clarification on uh, or any general AML questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, and that is to the right hand side. So if you're having any problems seeing that, um, it's the I'm looking at it now, it's the little chat bar. Um, make sure that you click all. Um, if you are not a chatty Cathy person and you want to focus on the beautiful people that we have here today, um, you can um, pop that chat out and close it so that you don't see it. Um, so we'll get started on a few stats when it comes to AML, just to get us warmed up this morning. Obviously, the ICAEW supervision report came out this week. Um, so that's kind of kicked up some dirt, should we say, in terms of the state of AML in the UK. Um, but FirmCheck has done an, a, a significant amount of research of our own when it comes to the state of AML. I um, mean, some of those stats are here. So as you can see, the policy controls and procedures document, which the ICAEW focused on um, in their supervision report, um, you can see here that 74 percent said um, that they have it in effect and 24 percent don't. Um, we don't have to dive in exactly to these but you can see that a lot of people that responded here um, stated that they don't have these critical documents or processes in place. Um, some of the common areas uh, documented policy controls and procedures, just like I said, lack of staff training. Um, this counts as staff training, guys, as well, which is awesome. Um, and your firm-wide risk assessment um, and ongoing monitoring, which sometimes can uh, get confused, but that just means reviewing your client on an annual basis at minimum. Um, so a wee bit <laughs> more stats. Um, I find stats really helpful sometimes because they make you feel like you're in company. So if you say don't have a firm wide risk assessment and you'll like feel quite a lot of shame about it to see that 379 people that were audited by the ACCA um, also don't. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's okay. It means that there's a lot of people in the same boat as you who are trying to do better. And you can also see that the policy controls and procedures documents come through again from the ACCA um, and a whopping 1,362 people don't um, risk assess their clients. So that client risk assessment, that tick box that you have to go through um, to identify the risk from the client. Okay, that was a quick 
run through. Um, with all of those stats, guys, is it really that bad? Are we doing a bad job at the, in, as, as UK, as the UK? Is the state of AML really that bad? I'll, I'll, I'll go with you first, David. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes is the short answer. It's really that bad. Um, I, I have to say that I deal with generally people who are in trouble with their supervisory body or they are expecting a review and expecting to be in trouble with their supervisory body. So the people who are, have got it all sorted and they're fine with it and it's all going to go great, I don't see them. Uh, and so I'm not getting a um, representative sample, I think is the statistical terminology. But yeah, I do see, uh, for example, I was talking to somebody the other day and about risk assessments and, I, and they said to me, yeah, we, uh, we risk assess all our clients, we've got hundreds of clients, we've, we've risk assessed them all. Uh, it's just that we haven't actually written anything down about it. And I'm like, um, quietly, of course, uh, but documentation is so important. And I think documentation is a word we're going to hear a little bit over the next hour. Documentation is so important with these things. And to say you've done a risk assessment and I've not written anything down, gets you nowhere. I'm sorry, that, that counts as not having done a risk assessment. And um, I don't want to harp on about ICAW too much, um, just because I happen to be a member of that one. Um, but their report, as you mentioned, has just come out. And one of the facts that they mentioned is that of the firms which they graded as not compliant, which is the, the worst of the three possible outcomes, of those not compliant firms, over a quarter, had not done risk assessments on any of their clients. Now, that to me is a fairly major uh, foul up in terms of not complying with AML. And um, I, I will let in in, in, in a minute. I'm, 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 Don't worry, David, Ian, I'm writing notes. <laughs> Ian and I could talk about money laundering for the next three days uh, without interruption, but we won't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, risk assessments, um, and I was looking the other day at the money laundering regulations of 2003. And they were the first money laundering regulations that came in that applied to accountants in general practice. And I looked for the word risk in those 2003 regulations. It's not there. There's no mention of risk assessments in 2003. And I remember getting some training in 2003 and I'm thinking, oh, crikey, I've got to ID all my clients. Well, yeah, that was what, how it was 20 years ago. But there are people around who are still at that place of AML means I've got to ID all my clients, full stop, end. Mm. And it's just not that anymore. It's all about risk and risk assessments. So, mm. right, let, let me shut up for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and often... Um... There's like, say, I was Starling Bank at the moment who are fined 24 million pounds for failures in AML compliance. There's often, and like you have a, you have a look on AWeb, there's always some story somewhere of some negative impact of failure of AML compliance. I suppose I'll pose the same to you as well, Ian, in terms of we often are on that line where people are in that maybe emergency situation or walking into a situation where there's been long-term non-compliance but overall is it is it that bad is the portion of people who aren't doing well more than the people who are doing well um I, well, the, the, the beauty of having me and david on this on this call is that we do see this things from slightly different perspectives and the company i work for now um my own company you know, it does support firms, but it also provides services to professional bodies because my past is working with ACCA and IFA, Institute of Financial Accountants. Uh, and so the perspective is slightly different, but I would say, yes, when you look at the, um, the that first slide of what people are falling down on, uh, these are sort of significant points. And what that says to me is actually people don't know where to start, or some people don't know where to start. Looking at the poll, this morning, you know, there's 50% of people here who are reasonably confident were they to have a, um, a, a, a monitoring 
supervisory review. Um, but even those people probably would like to spend less time working on AML compliance and, and feel more, more confident. So, you know, there's, I think I would, I would probably differ from David where David says, you know, he sees the worst uh, uh, um, situations and therefore compliance is bad. I think I would say, we don't really know, to be honest, because we get all different uh, reports on AML compliance from different sources. So a couple of months ago, I think it was the report from Opbas came out um Opbas has a certain vested interest at the moment in terms of the supervisory framework potential changes um i'm not sure what impact that has on its report but it, it's it's not very clear the direction in which we're heading from Opbas's reports because they're very um keen on confidentiality and they don't the report this year isn't on the same professional body supervisors as previously and we don't know who those supervisors are so what I find slightly more enlightening um, is the Treasury report, which looks at things like uh, HMRC supervision and the professional body supervisors. And, and OK, they grade their firms in slightly different ways as to whether they're compliant, generally compliant or non-compliant. But if you look at the number of firms, um, well, let's say the number of firms that are supervised by HMRC and are non-compliant, I, I, got a feeling it's somewhere around 40, 50%. It, it, it's, it, yeah, about 47%, I think it is, looking at my notes here. Um, the ICAW report, um, the non-compliant firms are around 17%, uh, I think, 18%, something like that. And if you look at the Treasury report at all the professional bodies, supervisors, it's around 18%, albeit that's a year behind. We're looking at 22, 23 for the Treasury report. Um, and if you take out the two worst performers in terms of um, the, the firms that they supervise, it's around 14%. So it's quite low, the percentage of firms that are non-compliant. So pick the bones out of that. What does all that mean? Does it mean that the professional body supervisors aren't really recognizing those firms that are non-compliant? I don't think that's the case. Um, but certainly from my perspective of being with professional bodies, I have seen a range of um, competencies and attitudes towards AML compliance. Uh, and some really don't know where to start. They've buried their head in the sand for, for a long time. And others still have things to learn but they're, they're a more diligent, they have a more diligent approach to AML compliance and engagements with their professional body supervisor. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that engagement with your professional body supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something, um, like I've been in this industry for a year. So the thing I'm starting to kind of understand is everybody has a different interest in AML. So the professional body supervisors, say ICA, WACCA, they all have their own metrics of how they um, audit their members. And they obviously, not, not saying this is dodgy deals, but I mean, they obviously don't want to be seen as um, an overly not compliant supervisory body, right? And then you've got Opbass who is sitting on top of everybody um, and maybe that gives more of a realistic view. There's lots of, and then me as a vendor, I'm talking to people or on the daily who are like, I need help, obviously, because they need an AML software solution. So um, there's lots of different vested interests. It feels different than say like where we have a police committee are on the news who is that source of truth of actually what things are like and there's different reports and you know firm checks chuck their hat in with one of them as well so um there's a lot of different areas i think the thing i appreciate appreciated reading about icaw is um their report was that they said that we'll continue to move the um bar to further stricter uh, AML compliance, which I was like, that's very ballsy to say we're going to make it harder every year. And I was like, I'm just trying to get people to collect an ID, guys. Like, come on. <laughs> but I really appreciated that. So there's different vested interests. Um, there is. So can I just come, come in there about sort of moving the bar? I, I think the key word um, in the ICAW report is effectiveness. And yes. this is a word that the professional body supervisors have been hearing from Opbas for, for, for some years now, um, that they want to see that effectiveness in the professional body supervisors. So if ICAW are moving the bar that way, um, and you know, they, 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 you know, we talked about 
Paul briefly mentioned client risk assessments just now, and they, they put it in context in terms of uh, client risk assessments as part, of, as part of the client due diligence. So it's quite an informative report, especially the, the introductory um, sections I, I, I found. But if ICAW are going that way uh, and talking about effectiveness in the way that they supervise their firms, then it seems quite likely because of course all the supervisors talk to each other and support each other in the supervisors forum it seems quite likely that the other supervisors especially in the accountancy sector will go the same way yeah and i yeah. think that's I, something can i mention a couple of quick things about you go, David. supervisors I, I think what the icaw were talking about or one of the things they're talking about is um they're trying to measure if accountants aml compliance is effective in identifying deterring money laundering amongst their clients um, which is great because that's what the legislation is aimed for but i think that accountancy firms are actually more concerned of, about um, the risk that their supervisory body is going to cause them grief rather than the risk that their clients are engaged in money laundering because accountants would generally say dodgy clients we don't touch them with a barge pole um we wouldn't we don't want to um and so there is no actual money laundering in our client base now they might not be actually right about that but that's what they would say yeah uh, and so i don't think accountancy firms are in that sense hugely worried about money laundering by their clients because they're saying that just doesn't happen what they are worried about is supervisory bodies coming and reviewing their work and saying you haven't ticked 103 boxes on this file uh, and that, totally. that's that's the difference i think and when people when i talk to people in person and i got aml they go oh my supervisory body how annoying and i'm like you're not worried about dodgy people or the risk to your business or the fines as always you are as lisa said you are so right david and um, so let's talk about the compliance gaps shall we because <laughs> i love when aml people get together and we just honestly it's like we're like we've all experienced the same things and we could as david said talk for three days um, but literally, because I've had a three-day webinar, so um, <laughs> we did talk about it for three days. Um, let's dive into the policy controls and procedures document. Um, again, I know I'm referencing the ICAEW report. If you're not a, not a member of that supervisory body, don't disregard what we're saying, because usually what is said there is quite can be relevant for other supervisory bodies too. And again, it's that... Um, it's what's going on in your neighbor's house, should we? You're always kind of curious about what's going on over there or you're having a look over and some of it's relevant to you. They might also be having roast chicken for dinner or something like that. But policy controls and procedures document. Um, Ian, do you mind giving a quick um, definition of what a policy controls and procedures document is just so we're all on the same page? <laughs> Oh, goodness me, I don't know if I can. Um, <laughs> the, fir the first thing to say, the first thing to say is, is it's needed. You know, you, you, it, it's very clear in the regulations. It's one of the first things that a professional body supervisor will look at. Um, <clears throat> I suppose the quick answer is the policies and procedures, which include controls, are there to mitigate the identified risks, though. The question is, where do you start? And I think it's possible to almost get an off the shelf set of policies and procedures. And that might be a starting point, but of course it's very, very obvious, again, from the perspective of a professional body supervisor, you can see when something has just been, you know, somebody's just paid a bit of money uh, and put filed a policy and procedures document away. Um, but that serves as a starting point after which you then um ad address the firm-wide risk assessment and there are various components of that and there are checklists that you can use and there are risk out there's a risk um outlook by aasg that that helps to look at the different components of the firm-wide risk assessment so you can approach that diligently you know and really focus on on, on your firm and then I would say, go back to your policies and procedures and the controls built into them and say, with that, with that deeper understanding, now think about are those policies and procedures achieving what they are designed to achieve? Um, 
And the policy and procedures have to be communicated amongst your relevant employees. And I think that, you know, when you think about that, then you're thinking about how those policies and procedures include with procedures and controls that your employees are going to take on board, which make, means that um, as perhaps a principal in a practice who is the money laundering reporting officer, you can sleep more soundly at night knowing that there are systems in place that the people who are closer to the, the clients uh, will be able to know their clients that little bit better, um, understand the risks and mitigate the risks. Um, at this point, I just want to highlight we talk a lot about AML risk, and maybe at some point I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, because I think it's all very well to say, you know, it's risk-based and we need to think about the risks. What do we mean by that? You know, and that might be an, a, a starting point for people to engage with, with AML compliance a little bit more. Can and I just have two pennies on, on policies, controls and procedures? Uh, I was about because... to swing for you, David, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bypass me completely. I'm not even here. You you go. Yeah, what were you yeah. going to say? <laughs> See you, Sophie. Yeah. Um, so, yes, policies, controls and procedures. Uh, the, the danger that I see in practice is, and, and Ian's alluded to this, that you, you have downloaded a template from somewhere. Um, and there's a few little bits where you have to fill in the names. And you've done that. And you think, right, I've got my policy controls and procedures document done. Well, yes, you have. But when you get a supervisor's visit, they will look at that. And of course, they'll see, oh, yes, this is that template that they've used and they haven't actually changed it. But, but that's fine. And then they'll say, so it says here in the policies, controls and procedures document that you do this. Um, let's see, in relation to some clients, you doing what it says. And lo and behold, they say, oh, well, we don't actually do that. We, we do it another way. And you're thinking, well, then and that, that should have been in the policies, controls and procedures document. If you use a piece of software for your AML compliance, then obviously that's got to be mentioned in your policies, controls and procedures document. If you have um, clients, if you focus your firm on a particular niche of clients, um, then that is going to get a mention in the policies, controls and procedures document, probably going to get more of a mention in the firm-wide risk assessment, to be fair. But as Ian says, uh, these are two important documents, but they don't live separate lives in separate countries. They actually are supposed to relate to each other. And indeed, the firm-wide risk assessment is supposed to relate to the risk assessments that you do on individual clients as well. There's supposed to be some connection. It's all like part of a whole... Um, uh, whole universe of AML that fits together and if you're just pulling documents from here and there and putting your name on them you're not going to have that and it's not going to represent your firm which is let's be honest every firm is unique every firm is different in some ways so every firm I would say is going to have its own unique firm-wide risk assessment its own unique uh, policies controls and procedures document yeah yeah and that's something that's come through in discussion also is that it's now not enough just to have a document uh that's you get a tick for having the document what is now needed is a understanding of the document that the document is relevant to your firm um it's not just copied and pasted off your supervisory body's website or whatever have you it needs to be relevant i think taking um i find it's easier to get AML or to subscribe to AML um, if it's AML's taken out of it. And for me, policy controls and procedure documentation is just that cheat sheet for your staff to know what to do um, in certain phases of the function of AML in your business. And at the very least, it means less questions to you as the firm <laughs> manager. You can say, why don't you look at the policy controls and procedures document? I swear it's in there. Um, so there's a win there too. But it just ensures that you're prepared. It's like a fire drill, should we say, that you know what to do in the event of a fire um, when it comes to AML or how you're going to go about it. Um, and love people are sharing about what um, AML software they use as well. 
Firm check is one of them, guys. Um, but I think that's really great that you're sharing because um, it's really important to everybody has the resources. And I, I prefer when people are honest and have that community uh, sharing aspect when it comes to AML. So just go for it. Um, okay, staff training. Um, oh, uh, policy controls and procedures. Yeah, okay, let's go to staff training because I'm aware we could yap all day. Um, this is a little bit of a I don't have time sort of factor um, I hear often um, or people do it on the side or when they do have time. Um, to me, training and education, no matter what industry or what topic is critically important, because for me, if someone is trained and they have a uh, thorough understanding of what they're doing, then they'll then they'll do it rather than you just saying collect an ID with no context. Um, training can be often quite Gray, um, Ian, what do you think uh, constitutes good training when it comes to AML or what do you think firms should be doing when it comes to ticking that AML training box? Um, got a number of things to say. First thing is to recognise how important it is. Um, so um, <clears throat> there is, you know, and, and I, well, let's get to the, the quick answer is engagement, is, is staff engagement. So, you know, it's training that really engages staff is, is is really helpful and, and that is aided by the fact that um, training is extremely important not only a requirement of the money laundering regulations but effectively uh, almost indirectly it's a requirement of the proceeds of crime act as well uh, um, because uh, a, an individual within a firm has a res their own responsibility to report internally uh, suspicion of money laundering um, uh, to not do so as a criminal offence and the defence against that is to say well I haven't received the appropriate training from my employer so that's an indication of how important training is. Um, I think it almost concerns me when people say well we haven't got time for it or you know where do I look for it you know how do I insert an hour's AML training to all my staff during the course of the year whereas in fact training is probably taking place or close to it without even recognizing it and the, re the reason I say that is you've got all those opportunities when you've got when, when you update your firm wide risk assessment or you update your policies those policies have to be really relevant and they have to be communicated as does the firm wide risk assessment you can email them out to your staff or you could actually email them out to your staff and follow up with the team meeting to discuss them um, and they might even evolve in a way that is is even more tailored to your firm if you do that. But it's that engagement that, that ensures that your staff really understand the policies and the procedures, um, but also apply them to the nature of the practice and the clients within it and start to think about what the risks are, you know, in, in really authentic ways. And that makes then the client risk assessments and the, and the due diligence much easier as well. And then again, taking it out again, if <laughs> taking it out again, <laughs> if your staff are trained, then they're going to be more confident and then they're going to ask you less questions. So there's also that there. So you've, if you've got confident staff, you're going to have a more streamlined process when it comes through with your AML compliance. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and you are required to have uh, specifically policies and procedures relating to internal reporting of suspicion. So if you have confidence that your staff understand that, and even if they don't report internally, they know who to consult, then you know it all helps you to sleep soundly at night. Sorry, David, you're keen to... Yeah, I, I was going to mention the D word again, um, because I, I was talking to uh, a firm about AML, uh, and we got onto the topic of training and they said training yeah we have monthly meetings with staff every month something about aml comes up we do a lot of aml training and i said great can i see the training record and of course there wasn't one uh, and that isn't going to cut it with the supervisor there needs to be a training record um now um slight cheap plug here um i do training um, I, I, I actually um, have recorded a set of training videos with um, a guy called Giles Mooney, who's well known in tax circles. Um, and at the end of that uh, session, there's something like four 20 minute sessions. At the end, there's a uh, 10 multiple choice questions and you have to get eight right. 
Uh, and so there is then a record that people have viewed the thing and that they've understood it because they've done the test and got it right. Now, I know firm check does a lot of training as well, and I'm sure, Sophie, you're going to mention that. Um, but yeah, th there is plenty of training available, uh, but mm. it does be documented. And I would say, if you have a test at the end and a mark, a pass mark, uh, then that nails it down from the point of view of showing the supervisory body that you've done it. Yeah. And I think I, 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 tot I totally agree. And, you know, if, if a particular element of training doesn't have that, then at least um, those people who have done the training online can perhaps get together and, and talk about, you know, what, what the outcomes were from that training. And again, it's turning um, something that is, you know, just an input, which is providing training into effectiveness. And that I think it is where we're going. Um, and the other thing I was going to say about um, training and you know you, you mentioning the d word sort of remind me of this <clears throat> is that training you can make staff responsible for recording their own training after it's happened you know and those documents can be stored in a shared space um but actually documentation before the event is quite useful as well in other words planning and why not incorporate staff training into your planning cycle you probably do anyway but thinking about aml when you do that um and it comes back to this thing that aml doesn't aml compliance doesn't take place in a vacuum so sophie you mentioned policies and procedures earlier on that you know they don't have to just relate to aml compliance they can be all sorts of things that are beneficial to the firm as a whole so yeah. you know in other words you know don't don't regard AML compliance as a burden where you have to do this, 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 but actually it all can be, to a large extent, integrate, integrated into other firm-wide procedures. Um, when we've done webinars before and spoken to um, education and training, there was a question that really resonated at the time of someone being like, I'm a sole practitioner, it's just me. It's nonsense that I have to write a training policy for myself. And I'm sure that resonates for some other people that are on the call at the moment, whether or not it's just yourself or if there's three people at the firm. And unfortunately, yeah, it is. it feels a little bit silly, but it is critical and it is part of legislation that you have that in place and maybe if you flip it on your head on its head again if you put that policy in place it ensures holds yourself accountable that you will actually find the time to do that um so I find that something that sticks often and people yet yeah, don't have the time but I spoke to a firm who said every Thursday afternoon is training time and they sit around and talk about a topic and obviously that feels like a luxury to some but this firm is only 10 to 12 people big um, and they're able to dedicate that time and overall it will improve time in other places but you've got to spend it up up front I can see you itching David were you going to say something else I, I was just going to say um there's actually on the chat quite a few interesting questions coming in and I'm wondering Sophie we I suspect we're not going to have time to answer them today live but um can we maybe do some written answers and dish them out to people afterwards? yeah okay. yeah definitely um I will move us uh I will move and shake us down down the line though I did see a question of someone asking for clarification on risk assessments so yeah. there is your firm-wide risk assessment that covers uh all the risks uh to that you've identified to your firm um and then your client risk assessment which is you risk assessing your individual client um can we David, I'll go with you first. Um, can you discuss the practical application of firm-wide risk assessments? Um, and it, as we've said in, in our opening session, it's often something that's missed for firms and leading to non-compliance. Why do you think yeah. that is? And can you just allude a little bit further to what a firm-wide risk assessment is? Yes, th there's a sort of hierarchy actually of, of risk assessments. Uh, in terms of AML, there is a UK government risk assessment, which is uh, the UK government's assessment of the AML risks affecting the UK economy as a whole. Uh, and then below that, if you like, there's the um, accountancy, um, um, accountancy bodies, rather, risk assessment, which is a risk assessment of the AML risk applying to the accountancy sector in the UK economy. And then the next tier down is 
The firm wide risk assessment, which is a risk assessment that each firm prepares, they do, don't they? Uh, that each firm prepares um, relating to the risks, the AML risks that apply to that firm as a whole. And then there's the individual client risk assessment that relates to the AML risk relating to that particular client. And the theory is that each of these in the hierarchy feeds off the ones above um, so that your um, firm-wide risk assessment will cover various areas of which the two key ones, I would say, are the clients, the type of clients that you have, the businesses that they are in, uh, and the services that you provide. Do you provide accountancy services? Do you provide payroll services? Do you provide bookkeeping services? Do you provide audit services, insolvency services? Do you have a client bank account for client funds? Do you give investment advice? You know, all these sort of things. So depending on the type of services um, you supply, then there's a section of the firm wide risk assessment that applies to the services. And then the remaining sections, um, I'm not supposed to say this, they're less important. Um, the, the geography, I mean, obviously, if you've got clients who are based in Eastern Europe or in Russia or whatever, then, then geography is an issue. Um, if all your clients are in Basingstoke, then geography really isn't going to be an issue. Uh, and uh, then there's transactions. And when we say the transactions section, a lot of people think this is about our clients' transactions in their businesses. And it's not. It's actually about our transactions with the client. And as accountants, our transactions with the client are very dull and boring. We send them bills, they pay us the money. That's it. Um, there's not really a, a money laundering risk, risk there. But you've got to remember that the money laundering regulations were not written for accountants. They're written to cover, for example, banks and so on. And for a bank, transactions, yeah, transactions is very important. For accountants, no, it isn't. Um, and then um, there's a sort of others uh, area uh, where you can put in other, other types of, of risk. And um, if you are, for example, um, dealing with takeovers and mergers or something like that, then th there might be something that you, that you want to mention there. Or if you are uh, mentioned in a particular niche, you might want to mention something there. Okay. And then the idea is that once you've got this firm-wide risk assessment done, your individual client risk assessment follows a similar sort of pattern. Uh, you ask yourself about this client, uh, what business are they in, what sort of things do they do? Do they have, for example, a cash intensive business is one that we keep hearing about. Um, uh, do they have transactions uh, through uh, online services such as PayPal, which might be at higher risk of money laundering? So, uh, and then what services do we provide to this client? Um, do we handle any client money, for example, in payroll? Do, do we have an arrangement where they give us uh, a lump of money and we use that to pay their staff and keep the change? Um, and if we do, there's a, there's a much higher money laundering risk associated with that than if we don't do payroll at all or if we don't have control of their money. Um, hmm? Yes, oh, sorry. I could talk for an hour and a half, couldn't I, on firm-wide risk assessments? So I'll stop there. But those are some <laughs> of the issues. Yeah. Perfect. Other than that, it's everything else. I was going to say, so there is um, templates online um, that you can access um, from your supervisory body. Um, within Firm Check, there's actually a snazzy feature when it comes to your firm-wide risk assessment. But I'll leave Nathan to talk to that um, when we do a product demo at the end of the session. Um, and at the end of the session, when we do the product demo, we'll also answer the questions that have flowing through. I apologize if you saw me looking to the side I'm like oh my god this is this is there's a lot of really good questions there um so I'll move and shake us along um if you would like us to pivot and answer these questions live put a comment in we do have a fair few um but to get through the topics today um but I was going to ask you Ian um firm-wide risk assessment always comes up as something that firms don't have why do you think firms don't do it or don't have one I think simply they don't understand its value, um, and hopefully we're getting a bit of that over to the to, to the um, attendees today because it it 
and, and you know, I think David did a very good job of sort of highlighting the important aspects of a of, of, of firm wide risk assessment. Let me again point you towards the AS, AASG risk outlook, um, which sort of breaks down all those elements. So it puts a little bit of um, flesh on the bones, I suppose. Um, I think I think having having said that a large proportion of firms don't do client risk assessments, um, according to the ICAW report, <clears throat> I think that is that is more the focus, I think, of, of, of firms. And so, you know, where does the, the firm wide risk assessment come in? But I think it comes in in two, two respects. We've talked about the interaction of that between that and, and the policies and procedures and controls. Um, but also it does help to focus the mind uh, when it comes to, to client risk assessment. So you can have, like I say, you can have training around the firm wide risk assessment, training around the policies, procedures and controls. And then when an individual manager is risk assessing a, a, a potential new client, for example, they're a little bit more engaged as, 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 with what they're looking at. Um, I yeah, still think... I, sorry, I, I, there's something I should have said, and it is important, so I'll... Sorry to crash in again, Ian. Um, and that is the firm wide risk assessment should do um, three things. It should say where we are, um, what the risk is, and how we address that risk, how we mitigate that risk. Um, so that it's not simply a, oh my goodness, we've got all these um, cash intensive businesses. It's, yes, what do we do about that? Um, because uh the the point of all this stuff is is that you recognize the money laundering risks and then you address them to try and reduce them uh, and i i didn't say that yeah um, my... and it, and it might be a sort of identify you know mention cash cash intensive businesses it might be identifying training needs so that when one of those businesses come along we understand how to you know what the risk is and how to mitigate it um so I think I think it's worth mentioning at this point when it comes to risk assessment generally, you mentioned the national risk assessment, the government risk assessment, um, and for the accountancy sector, memory is probably section nine of that. So, you know, there's only a small portion of the NRA that actually relates to the accountancy sector, to be honest. Um, but, you know, it talks about the, the high risk services, which are trust or company services, because that obscures individuals and organizations and helps to obscure where money is flowing from. Um, payroll you mentioned, uh, bookkeeping uh, is another one. Uh, and bookkeeping forms part of what they call mainstream accounting services where the, the process that, that's undertaken by the firm of accountants helps to change the flow of funds, I suppose, into a legitimate set of accounts and in between you know, they may be looking at documents, whether those documents are, are, are false or, or legitimate um, is an important thing to consider. And if, if they're false, then actually the, the, the bookkeeping service is converting something that is false into something that is relied upon by third parties. And it's all about that obscurity. Um, so having mentioned that, and those are the sorts of clients that, that maybe you deal with and sort of services that you provide. Then when we come to look at the client risk assessment, we're just more in tune with, with where the risks are. However, what I would say is that the risks relating to a particular client are unique to that client. Each business is, is unique. Um, so if you take, you know, classic example is nail bars, um, isn't it? Um, yeah. Cash-based businesses, maybe, um, but the thing that makes them particularly high risk is that they are based around personal services. So there's not a lot of margins, you know, not a lot of, of, of um, direct costs apart from labour that, um, that that you can use to to actually mitigate the risk and get a better understanding of the business. More generally, what I would say about a, a potential client or an existing client coming to you, uh, you sit down with them and you talk to them about their business and you listen to what they say. I'm a great advocate of listening. Um, and that's another story, but um, <laughs> nothing to do with you, Dave. Don't, don't take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of the way first of all. 
but, but, but your clients will love to talk about their businesses. So if you just ask them, you know, to say to them, tell me more about your business and sit back, they'll talk till the cows come home. And, and that it'll be is great. part of AML as well. Like talking to Absolutely. your clients is part of AML. And like we, I will speak to people um, and they go, oh, I know my clients. And I'm like, but you need the documentation, darling. I, sorry, I don't call people darling. I mean, like you need the documentation, <laughs> sir, accountant, <laughs> um, to prove that you've actually done that. Because that's the difference is um, someone put in the chat before um, that uh, all their clients are their friends and they know them and that's low risk, right? Right? that does not matter to your professionals like your supervisory person your supervisory body you need to show your supervisory body that you know that client through documentation not just from they live down the street yeah. so when we're talking to talking to people that is part of aml you just need to document it that that's the main thing i'm just going to shake us along oh yeah can I say one, say one more thing you know, on that note? You know, the checklist that you use to, to sort of steer a conversation with your clients and check that they've covered everything is, is really useful. But, you know, given that you've sat back and let your client talk, you know, write a few paragraphs about that conversation, then take a step back and just say, you know, does this all make sense to me? Does this business make sense? Does it make sense why this client is coming to me for the services that they want? But as, as you say, it's about documentation and capturing the things that you've learned exactly I'll one thing that I've, on the sorry, last one, one thing that i've seen as a quick example um okay a client comes along and says uh, yeah a new client i've got this company this business uh, we're just starting out actually um actually it's it's my brother's business um but he's going through a bit of a messy divorce oh, 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 oh. Um, sorry um, david we, david yes. you've just turned into a robot do you mind just trying oh. saying that again Right. So uh, they come and say, yeah, actually, I've got this new business. It's my brother's business, actually. Uh, but he's going through a messy divorce. He doesn't want his wife or ex-wife to find out. Um, so it's all being put in my name, um, but it's not really me. Now, from an AML point of view, that's a huge red flag for me, because what it's saying is that the person in whose name these transactions are being done, isn't actually the person who's doing the transactions. So there's a huge money laundering risk there. There's also the risk that actually these um, him and his brother are committing an offence called perverting the course of justice because they are providing, potentially providing false information to the family court about the, the brother's financial affairs by hiding stuff. So it, it actually is money laundering. Mm -hmm. And for accountants, we don't think of our nice clients who are, you know, trying to help each other out um, as money launderers. But it, it's caught up by that um, by that legislation, sadly. Um, due to the nature of conversation, um, in that we have covered maybe three points of the five points that we promised for the people who registered for the webinar today, we may run a little bit over. Um, you do get a recording of this after if you do need to race off, um, but I will try to keep you guys a little bit more to time, um, if that's okay. But I'll, I'll just ask one more question, and then we'll pick some to, some audience questions to answer just since there has been so many I think I can see that there's 11 questions sitting there um as I said there'll be a demo of the firm check product um Leo I think you maybe need to look at the firm check product because everything that you're doing you can do on one platform with firm check got to do the plug to pay the bills um but if you stay for that then we'll answer some of those questions during that demo so that's a little bit of a do you call it a frog in the hole of you have to watch a demo to uh, get the questions answered anyway um client risk assessments Back to that. So this will be our last question. So client risk assessments. Um, again, I see AEW emphasize that um, client risk assessments, and I've seen it. I've sat next to accountants when they're completing their client risk assessments that they just go, do, 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 done, 10 seconds. And I see AEW said that that's not sufficient that people are mis missing disclosing risk factors when doing that client risk assessment. Um, why do you, I'm going to chuck this to you, Ian, because I know, David, you'll jump in at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do you think people are spinning through client risk assessments, um, just ticking boxes and then putting them in effectively in the bin or not doing them at all? 
Um, well, it's, it's the usual thing. It, it, it's it's time. It's you know, go rushing on to the next thing, not appreciating the value of the information that you're gathering as part of that process. Um, not understanding risk, so they don't start that client due diligence process uh, with you know having thought about the firm wide risk assessment and the, the nature of this particular client, the sort of things that they should be inquiring into. So they're they're addressing it. They have to address it as a tick box exercise because they don't understand um, the value of um, the, the public value of, of AML compliance. But actually, they're they're assuming that um, the cost of client onboarding is just a, a sunk cost that they have to suffer in order to get a client. And you know, I don't think that that's the case. You know, I think that there's there's nothing wrong with telling your client that you want a payment on account, that, you, that you're gonna charge for the onboarding process. And I think that's right, so that the onboarding process is done diligently. Um, and, and, you know, it, is, it, is, it has become easier to do ID verification. And so the ID verification comes before the risk assessment and before they're sort of really getting to know your client, you're trying to doing it, do it as quickly as possible. You probably haven't got time to throw up the slide that, um, I, I gave you on the client due diligence process, but that's absolutely fine because I'll point everyone now towards the anti-money laundering guidance for the accountancy sector. Um, the acronym is AML GAS, which is the CCA, CCAB produced document. And in it, you'll see on client due diligence, a, a, a small table that breaks it down into the three parts of um, getting information, understanding the risks, and then getting the verification. And it does explain that that isn't necessarily a linear process that when you get some information from the client and you seek the verification, you might have to go back to a previous stage. Um, but it's all good engagement with your client, firming up that client relationship. And so it's also a value to, to the practice, I believe. And it doesn't help. Um, I feel like when it's the same set of questions for every client, so then you kind of get like um, David has a video that he says that he shares about spotting the difference between two two situations. And if you get so used to just ticking a box, ticking a box, then you'll tick the box and miss something. I I sat next to an accountant who was doing a client risk assessment. You can do a client risk assessments and firm check. Um, I knew this client was from Russia, and they just went da 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 low risk, and I was like, oh darling that person's from Russia, you, you've missed disclosing that. And that's what's come through again, is if you miss, it's not just about doing it, it's about doing it right. Um, do you have any parting words, David, on client risk assessments and why people just move and shake through them quickly? That the Part of the problem is that some client risk assessments are based around uh, the red flags that are highlighted in the money laundering regulations. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the money laundering regulations were not designed primarily with accountants in mind, certainly not with um, accountants in, in Basingstoke or wherever who deal only with local clients. The, the money laundering regs are for international banks, global businesses and all that sort of thing as well. Um, so you get all these questions about does a client have a complex or unusual business structure? And you're thinking, he's a plumber. Come on. You know. <laughs> Tick, tick, tick. Uh, and because you you have these questions which are kind of not relevant, then maybe you don't stay alert to the questions that, that are relevant. <clears throat> and to me, one of the questions that, that is relevant is, are the, are the client's business records awful? <laughs> Shocking. You know, I've seen, I've come across cases where accountants have prepared accounts from post-it notes. Uh, where somebody's basically written on a post-it note, this week's takings were X, the expenses were Y, hand it to the accountant, 52 post-it notes come in, and the accountant produces a set of accounts and never sees any documentation in support of those post-it notes. Now, to me, that's high risk because there's a, a serious risk that um, the client might be under-declaring his income on those post-it notes. So how do you address that risk? If it's high risk and if we need additional due diligence, enhanced due diligence, um, 
what should that be? Does that mean we have to ask him for another utility bill or another passport document or mm. a driving license? No, it's not about his ID. The issue isn't about who he is. The issue is about his recording of income. So your enhanced due diligence is around about how do we check that he's got all his income recorded? Um, can we persuade him to do a, a more complete set of records for us? Uh, should we see his personal bank accounts uh, to make sure that they are consistent with what we know about his business and so on and so on? Um, there was a question about enhanced due diligence. What is it? Well, it depends on what the risk is. It's about addressing the risk that you've identified. So, yes, I'll stop at that point. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I'm just doing side stuff just to make sure that we're rolling along okay. Um, it's actually really lovely to see um, everybody talking in the chat too um, and helping each other. Of, do I do this or do I do that? And it's not, they're often not things that we're talking about here, but that's something I'm really passionate about is um, people helping each other and often being vulnerable and saying, I don't really know what this is. Can you please help? And when we do these firm check webinars, um, somehow we manage to attract really helpful, uh, knowledgeable people who don't shame people for not knowing what things are. Um, I've just asked my colleague Nathan in the background, um, who he said, sure. Um, we actually have an AML uh, WhatsApp group where you can ask questions. Um, it's off the back of our summer school that we did, which was a five-week webinar series. Um, so I'll share that WhatsApp. Nathan, who's darling it would help me um we'll share that whatsapp group um for you guys to join and ask each other questions and help david's there maybe uh, ian i can share it with you if you want to have a look around but um shall we pick maybe two or three questions um that we want to answer live and then we'll conclude um we have missed some of the points but i feel like the conversation has evolved um is let me see uh if I can see. While you're looking, I can answer one quickly. Um, yeah, somebody said, I, I did a, a, an electronic ID check on somebody and it came through fine. And I found out afterwards he was in prison. Uh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't tell you about the criminal records. It, if you do an ID check on David Winch, electronic check on ID, uh, David Winch, it'll tell you that I exist and that I have a mortgage and all these sort of things. Um, it won't tell you that I'm actually doing this broadcast from Wormwood Scrubs because I'm doing 14 years for drug trafficking. That isn't information that comes in an ID check, but it is something that you should know about if I'm your client. Yeah. And just to add to that again, the, the ICAW report, which talks about effectiveness, the, the people who do their monitoring have... <clears throat> they actually do open source checks and they have found that some information you know could have been picked up by the firm so things are slipping through no thank you so for that open I've... source checks we, we mean we mean google don't we we're not saying it but we <laughs> yes yeah, googling and seeing if anything naughty comes up in google on that client yeah. um that's really great thank you for that ian because there was a question about that is that um yeah as it as stated the icaw went through and did their own research on members clients um correct me if i'm starting to get a little bit too out of the bounds but they did yeah research and they found stuff that the firm had missed and so then therefore that's naughty on the firm that they didn't that they didn't catch mm. it so you have to be thorough in that i'm going to pick up this question from kieran um we use online platform to run aml for our clients and collect their ids addresses during onboarding we of course do annual review and update any changes um ian would you recommend anything else um I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what what's being asked there other than um, doing enough? keep 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 your finger on the pulse sort of thing you know use every opportunity to to understand your client and, and know them as well as you can as well as your client wants wants you to you know a good client wants you to to get to know them um I think I mean, this this question maybe is linked, and I'm, I'm itching to sort of just add something to that 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 last point that was made about uh, supervisors sort of second guessing and che and checking up. I, I would say when it comes to the expectations, and this is related to sort of IDs and, and and risk assessments and things, don't be too 
anxious uh, about what your AML supervisor is doing, if they are moving towards an approach that is more about effectiveness, um, then that's okay because I think firms need to understand effectiveness a little bit better. Um, and if they do so, they will engage with AML compliance more easily and the whole process becomes easier. I think it is, you're, you're sailing against the current if you're just trying to address things by means of checklists, for example. Yeah, I, I um, did a, a list recently um, and I'm gonna put it in a blog post next month. Um, of what I call the 10 fundamentals. And of course, now I'm sat here, I can't remember all the 10 fundamentals, but um, things like the policies, controls and procedures document, the firm-wide risk assessment, uh, the training records, um, you might need, it, particularly if you're ICAW, you might need um, uh, disclosure of borrowing service checks on your business owners and managers. That's the business owners and managers of your firm, not your clients. Um, and uh, one thing which seems to have come up recently is uh, that firms are supposed to, from time to time, monitor their own compliance with uh, AML procedures. The intention in the CCAB guidance that Ian mentioned is that that should be an independent review. They don't say an external review, they say an independent review. So if you've got other staff apart from the MLRO who understand about money laundering, and could, as it were, do an internal audit of your money laundering compliance and a few checks, then they should do that. And there are compliance checklists that you can get from the professional bodies. Um, if you can't do that, then I suggest, and I shouldn't suggest it, but I'm going to, that the MLRO does it himself, which I realize means the MLRO is marking his own homework. Uh, but if you use a compliance checklist, uh, it's much better than not doing a review at all. And when you have a supervisor's visit, they are going to likely ask, have you reviewed your own firm's compliance over the last two or three years? Have you done any checks on it to see that actually in practice it's doing it? Now, if there is only you in the firm, well, that's that's different. But if you've got staff, are they actually doing what you've asked them to do? Uh, are they actually uh, filling in the risk assessments? Do they actually understand um, what risks we're talking about, what we mean by risk in an AML uh, context, uh, those sort of things. Yeah. No. I, think, I, think, I think the um, compliance review aspect is, is really important because we're talking about closing the gaps and it's a pretty good starting place to, to, to identify where the gaps are. Um, and you are required to have within your policies and procedures, one that looks at the effectiveness uh, of those policies and procedures um and and therefore you know even a sole practitioner with, with no staff needs some sort of policy around compliance reviews even if they're only every two or three years um but it's all about you know the, the size and nature of the firm um but i agree that compliance checklists are a, are a pretty good place to start amazing um i am gonna summarize us sorry that is not a very delicate way of saying that but <laughs> Usually I can be like, and thank you so much for joining today, guys. But just because uh, we have talked so much and um, and I'm so grateful for the amount of knowledge that we've shared here today. Um, we and I, Firm Check, often do um, webinars of this nature um, and often get stuck into the weeds of it. So we have lots of content, lots of education resources that you can look to. Um, and now that you've registered for this one, um, you'll get informed of when we next do the next one. Someone asked a quick summary of the five gaps and me being concise, I'm going to do it unless there's any, and no interruptions. <laughs> yep. Um, we said, and some of the things that we didn't get to say, um, but I'm sure you value that why we didn't get to say them. But the policies, controls and procedures document is one of the most common gaps. People don't have it. Um, and remember that this is your how to of AML within your firm. Um, staff training is often missed. And as we said, staff training is really critical as it ensures that your team know what they're doing and they have the confidence to do it and eventually saves you time in your firm. Um, we talked about firm-wide risk assessments and remembering that's um, you risk assessing the risks 
that uh, could be imposed upon your firm, say, if you work with an international clients, um, if you work with clients that have crypto, those are all relevant risks that you need to um, outline in your firm-wide risk assessment. Um, you can create your firm-wide risk assessment within FirmCheck. Um, your client risk assessment is often missed as well. Um, within FirmCheck, you can't miss doing the client risk assessment. It forces you to do it and tells me you haven't done it. But that is you risk assessing your client if they live in um, a high-risk third country, um, they have lots of money that they can't explain, um, or just generally understanding who they are. One of the things that we didn't get to talk to is documentation. Um, and Nathan has said arguably the most important um, and he's quoted David, actually. Nathan's my colleague, as you can see in the chat, um, who has created this webinar for us. He said, my favorite quote from David is, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen, um, which we use internally at FirmCheck as well. And it's about having that conversation with your clients and documenting it as well as we linked with education. Um, FirmCheck doesn't see ID checks mentioned as a gap. Um, I saw some people talking about um, biometric checks or using verified tax calc. Um, your ID checks are part of it and it is often missed. Um, this can be a biometric check. This can be um, a driver's license. This can be taking a screenshot when you're um, on Zoom with a client um, as well. And then I had some big closing remarks, which I think we've said several big closing remarks. And the, oh, I can see your itch. What are you going to say? What you got? <laughs> I'm quite jovial with David because we're quite close friends, actually. <laughs> so he's not I'm a stranger. I'm saying nothing. I'm saying nothing at all. No, no. no. Thank you, Stacey. <laughs> you go, David. No, you could go for it. Everything you no. say is important to me. But that sounds like <laughs> it's not. <laughs> no, I'm, ju I'm just thinking everything you say is recorded and maybe used in evidence um because I, I do a lot of criminal work as you know so I, I i come across that quite a lot and um yeah um i i do unfortunately in my criminal cases come across people who have run businesses and are running criminal enterprises alongside um and the accountant hasn't picked it up so I appreciate everybody says, oh, all our clients, we know them all. They're all honest as the day is long and so on. Um, you might get a nasty surprise one day. Um, yeah. Sorry about it's that. It's often yeah. the people that you know are the ones that are exploiting you when it comes to money laundering um, because they leverage your trust or you yes. can assume as much. Ian, yes. any closing Even... remarks or summary? Um, I, I could turn around the quote, if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. So, so well, if it happened, why on earth wasn't it documented? Because, you know, documentation, that there's, there's there's checklists and things there that are the documentation. And, and But, you know, and things like just documenting a discussion with a client because it, you know, puts a lot of flesh on the bones with regards to their, their business. Nice um, to each of your contributions for today. Sorry? <laughs> I said that's a nice quote of a like a puzzle piece for both your contributions today. If you if it happened, why didn't you document it? And then it's yeah, I, I'm not sure I quite quite understand that. To to be honest, <laughs> um, I suppose if if you're asked after some sort of closing remark, what 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 do I pick? I've got a few few things to that I've jotted down that I might mention, but um, I'm going to underline this sort of compliance review so that you know where to start. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Engage with the process and, and you'll find it a lot easier. But I think, you know, one way of engaging with the process is to ask yourself, what do we mean when we talk about AML risk? And there is certainly a risk to the practice uh, in terms of reputational risk if they if they um, breach the regulations or even commit a criminal offence. Um, but there's also, you know, think about the risk that you might actually be part of the money laundering process or the risk that you uh, are concealing money laundering by somebody else or another another organization um, or simply the risk that you will fail to report so to submit a suspicious activity report when you should have had reasonable suspicion um, of money laundering or terrorist financing um, i think i made a note in the icaw report that only was it only about 17 percent of supervised firms submitted um a suspicious activity report 
um, or was it 80? No, I think it's 80, 80, 87 percent didn't. Um, it, it's a very high number of firms didn't sub submit a, a report in the year to March 2024, which feels wrong to me. I don't know that it's wrong. It, it, it just feels wrong. So I understand what money laundering risk is uh, and really engage with, with AML compliance. Okay, let's put a line there. I think this this conversation is um, emphasised that we all need to go for a coffee and have a cathartic discussion about AML. <laughs> um, for all of us, this has been a group therapy session, um, which is fantastic. Um, Nathan, if you wouldn't mind chucking up some of the how to get in touch with these guys. Um, David, MLRO support, um, we'll pop that up there. Um, David, oh, Ian. <laughs> compliance for accountants um linkedin's a really great place to keep an eye out um all three of us post about um aml content um relevant aml news um perspectives things like that where we are what webinars we're doing um so you can connect with ian there um nathan in a second will pop up um i assume david's uh linkedin once uh, that has settled for a little bit, and there it goes there. Um, if you want to keep in touch with FirmCheck, our LinkedIn is a really great place um, where we um, share our recordings, um, or you're welcome to follow me on LinkedIn um, if you like. Um, love, love friends. Um, let's hang out more. Um, as we said, we're going to segue into a um, demo of the FirmCheck product um, for those who would like to stay and see that just out of curiosity. Um, but while that is being undertaken, um, if that's okay, if you guys don't have to race away, if you have to race away, that's okay. But we'll be um, commenting in the chat um, some of your to answer some of your questions that have lingered, um, and I'll be sending some details in an email um, tomorrow. But thanks. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, um, for all of the um, knowledge and information that you shared here um, and the topics. And, um, yeah, it really sparked a really great conversation with um, the viewers today. So thank you so much for that. I um, mean, I hope you have a good rest of your day yep. wherever you are that's sunny. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sophie. I'll say Bye goodbye. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Um... Hey, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen and, um, and I'll go we'll have away. a little look at, at FirmCheck. Yeah. And yes. um, thanks for everyone staying online. I'm going to do my best to keep this to 10 minutes. I am based in New Zealand, so it is 11.42 p.m. for me. So I'm going to make this nice and quick. Um, and then, of course, if you want to find out any more information uh, or get a more in-depth demo of the product, you can jump onto our website and schedule a time with the team or sign up for free. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, excellent. And so um, whilst I do that, we're just going to make sure that you don't have to uh, see my face. And there we go. And so what you're looking at here is um, the screen that you see when you need to log into FirmCheck. So we just spoke a little bit about policies, controls and procedures. You can document them here and uh, upload your firm policy, which I've already done. Um, you can also uh, populate and create your firm-wide risk assessment in here. And um, once it's complete, it'll put a date stamp on it and you can also remove that and then update that as a later date as uh, your client base evolves or as risks change, um, but it will always be there and you will always have that record of your firm-wide risk assessment in the product. So that's kind of your firm stuff taken care of. Um, and if there are questions, uh, I cannot see them because I'm on another screen, but I will get to answering them or perhaps Sophie will answer some of the easy ones in the chat as well. Um, so all I'm going to show you today is um, look, run through the CDD process and um, we won't dive too much into everything because I don't need to take up uh, that much time. So um, we'll just jump across here to the work tab. And so we've got this uh, Kanban um, style work view and um, where you can see uh, any AML reviews that you need to do. So we've got one here that needs to be reviewed, anything that's in progress and with the status of that, and then anything that you're waiting for. So, um, you know, obviously a key part of doing your AML and um, particularly where there's more than one of you, um, is submitting that 
uh, initial uh, assessment for review with someone else. And then as you can see, I've been really busy, but once everything is done, um, it moves into this done column as well. Uh, in this tab, um, if work is assigned to you, you can also have that opportunity to filter it as well and jump into those uh, reviews there. Um, but we'll start in the clients section. And so this is where you're gonna have a list of all the clients um, in the system. Um, now I'm just going to add a client and um, you can obviously add multiple client types, but just for the purpose of this, I'm going to jump into an organization. And then this is where we are pulling some of that information from Companies House um, for limited companies. And so I'm going to keep it strictly New Zealand and see what we've got. Some Kiwi apps. Yeah, we'll take a bit of that for the purpose of this demo. Um, you're just going to select your client status could be a prospect existing or we do have the archive feature as well so if you are bringing a bunch of existing data into firm check um, obviously there's a record keeping requirement but uh, we have an archive status so that you can still store that documentation here but you won't be charged for storing that at all but for this one i'm just going to say it's an existing client you also have the business, the ability to set business units. So I'm going to choose my little hometown here, and then I'm going to say that I'm a partner. Reference number, obviously not needed, but you can pop whatever you need in there. And then services, um, you can add as well. Now, this is quite an important uh, one, I guess. Um, you can totally customize your list of services in the firm settings based on what you offer. But this is a good one. Uh, for example, uh, as we know, payroll is deemed higher risk. So you want to make sure you make a note of that and I'll just put an accounts one in there as well just for completeness so you can see it but anyway we're going to skip on through to the related parties so as you can see it's pulled through um, two related parties um, into firm check here and that's coming from companies house and um, just to keep things nice and smooth I'm actually going to get rid of Michelle um, and we're just going to stick with Callum here uh, you'll find through the product we've got lots of little tips and um, to help you uh, along the way and so now we're just going to save and we're going to jump into uh, actually doing uh, the risk assessments and so on and so this is just uh, the first section is just summarizing your client profile, uh, pulling through all that information. And then we've got Callum here and we're just going to make sure that we mark down exactly uh, why we are completing due diligence on him. I'm just going to mark that section as completed. And then that is going to change to a tick. And then we've got client information risk assessment, verifications. And so client information, this is where you might drop the SIT code of uh, the business. Um, say what they do and um, any additional notes if you've got supporting documentation you can also add that in here so i'm just going to add a document and um, let's just drag a document across from over here and um, you can upload any documents and um, they will save into the system and um, obviously my internet connection is struggling at this time and i've uploaded a really large document but there you go and then in the additional due diligence section uh, if source of funds is required or source of wealth is required and um, you can also add those documents there and um, for now i'm just going to mark this uh, section as complete and then if we jump along to the risk assessment this is where you're going to have all those factors and some of those things that david and ian just shared in the webinar just now and um, and so if we click into these you've obviously got um different questions now these risk assessment questions um, in the firm settings or when you sign up to FirmCheck, we ask you what supervisory body you're part of. And then we have templates for a range of the supervisory bodies, which you can then customize in your settings, which I will quickly show you just so you can get an understanding. And you also, we also offer the ability to build custom ones um, as well. Um, and so obviously you go through these and identify any risks. You can also set all answers to no, so that's a little shortcut, but as we just discussed, you probably don't want to be just rushing through and doing that. And so I'm just gonna um, jump into one of these and we're gonna say uh, the client is based outside of the UK as an example. And this is where you can also pop in the risk mitigations factors. So we, um, we uh, will verify IDs using biometrics uh, as an example. Um, and once you've done that, you can save your risk assessment 
Um, and obviously it's going to highlight one uh, risk factor there and that's going to drop into your AML summary on the side. And the other step and the last step that I'm going to show you today is the verification. So as we mentioned, there's a range of different checks. And um, if you've already got the document, you can add the document here. You can upload the document, um, which I will just drag across um, there. And you can say that that's evidence of identity. And then it's just going to pull through and ask you um, a few details to confirm that it's verified. Now, what we uh, we've got this option to say the document has been verified and the date of the verification. And the reason we've got that is because we see a lot of uh, firms come across to us who ha have the document but didn't actually have the date marked on it. And um, as we know, we need to have that document verified. And um, having it on file um, is good, but actually making sure you've got a documented date of verification is important too. And I'm just going to say, and this means I met Callum face-to-face -face. Um, so I'm just going to add that document um, and that's going to change uh, the uh, tick um, on the um, on the ID verification tab. And this is why you should never demo live. There we go, proof of identity. And um, the other checks you can do is an essential uh, check, which costs a pound. And um, what this is doing is uh, running against various sources like the electoral roll and various registers, registers like that. And you do need to put an address here and it's basically to say, yes, Callum, this person is associated with this address. Uh, they are still alive. Um, so it checks against things like that. And then it's going to drop in, takes a matter of minutes, it's going to drop that this has happened in here as well. Um, you can always just run a PIP and sanctions and adverse media check on clients too, which is always free um, if that's all you want to do. And then the example, um, and Leo was mentioning it in the chat during the webinar, if you are remotely um, dealing with clients, then a good way to actually collect those uh, documents and verify them is using uh, an advanced ID check, which is where our biometric uh, functionality comes in. Now, the really important thing about this is that um, this is obviously uh, your risk assessment and um, is uh, we're not going to tell you the risk level that is absolutely in line with your uh, policies, controls and procedures, but this is where um, you're going to set that and just make sure that you've got uh, a record. Uh, of that as well. So that's just some standard CDD there. And then you can also set a review date. In this case, it's standard six to 12 months, but obviously in some cases, uh, high risk clients, you might bring that down to uh, one month, three month, um, whatever you do. Um, and in this case, I'm just gonna say, yes, it is okay to proceed. Um, I'm just gonna uh, make sure that I've got everything done there. Um, and uh, evidently, just going to go verification status is verified for the purposes of this. And then I'm going to go to review. And then this is where you can select another reviewer or for solo practices, if it's just yourself, you can select yourself. And then you can also confirm that you are happy with the decision just so there is a track record of that. So I'm going to submit that for review. And then this is when it's going to pop up. Um, into your uh, work uh, tab as well. And so that is everything. I'll just quickly show you in the firm settings um, your client risk assessments. And so as we mentioned, you've got a library. When I signed up, I selected ACCA, um, but you can also, um, whatever you select on sign up, you can customize that. You can change these templates. You can preview them. You can set different ones for different client types. And you can also add um, your own template and build that. And it's very much drag and drop. And as we mentioned, we've got tips and uh, recommended content that we also share along the way. And so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen there and jump back across and see if we've got any questions. Excellent. Um, okay, great. 
Um, well, I will leave it there. I will just share a, a little link. Um, as I said, uh, you can sign up to FinCheck for free or you can book a demo with the team. Um, signing up for free, you get full access to everything I've just shown you and you can also add uh, uh, one client um, of your choice. Uh, perhaps it's a friend's business um, and you can run a full biometric check with them as well. So you can see the reports and everything that comes back into FirmCheck um, for you. So I'll just drop that into the link now. And um, there you go. Uh, Sarah, yes. Uh, what happens when the 12 months is up? Do you get a reminder to review it? Um, yes, it will show in that Kanban view. It will show uh, that it's overdue, as you might have saw in my dashboard. Um, but we are also, um, it's not live just yet, but notifications is one of the things that the team is looking at in the background. So um, that it's a bit more proactive to get you into, um, into the software, as opposed to you having to come in to check. And do you end up with a PCP report? Stephanie, I assume you're referring to the policies, controls and procedures there. And at the moment we offer a template which you can customize and then you upload it. You can download that um, uh, from the system. So you've got that and so you can share your PCP. But in the future, similar to what I just shared with the risk assessment builder, um, team is looking into how you can actually also have a drag and drop soul policies, controls and procedures builder as well. Um, yes, aid Sophie's just answered that question, but it's six pounds per client. Um, the checks are just pay, pay as you go basis as and when you need. Um, there's no credits or, or bulk purchasing required for them. It's uh, very much just as and when you need it. So uh, for example, a common case that we see quite often is firms will already have verified a lot of documentation. They essentially just need to get their records in shape. So um, in that case, it's uh, six pounds uh, per client. Hopefully I've answered all the questions. Uh, correct, Debbie. It's five years and um, there is some uh, nuance there and hopefully if David or someone is still on the call, it's it's five, I think it's five years from the end of any business relationship um, is the one. Uh, do you charge for holding old data? No, we don't. So there is uh, the archived client setting. So um, if there's a client you no longer work with, um, you just archive that and you can continue to maintain the record for as long as um, as long as you need to, um, but yeah, there's no no charge for archived clients. Awesome. All right, we have gone plenty over time, and um, I will absolutely leave it there. It is three minutes to midnight. I'm off to my bed. And um, thanks to everyone for staying online. And as Sophie's already talked about, our recordings and everything will be shared um, tomorrow. And I uh, appreciate your your engagement and um, comments and chat. And I'll end the session there. Thanks, Tim.